get a beer, all right? Yeah. Ah, Ghostbusters 2. What can one say about Ghostbusters 2? Well, it's, uh, the second one. Yeah, so I get that a lot of people didn't like the 2016 reboot. Hell, for me, it just went in one ear and out the other, like 30 seconds of elevator music. But I do kind of lose it when people say, Oh my god, this ruined the franchise! Ah! Like, really? Did y'all sit through the second one? Cause, woof. Hey fans, remember those chain-smoking, booze-swilling, swearing Ghostbusters from the first movie? Well now they're dancing with toasters, hosting kids' birthday parties, and playing with babies. Oh, how cute! Remember when this guy used to zap dudes to hit on college chicks? That's okay, because now he's shacking up with the single mom he once shot up with enough Thorazine to kill a herd of elephants. Wait, they're not together anymore? Uh-oh, we gotta start over. Here we go again. But it's okay, because we got Winston. Remember him? Neither do we, because he's still missing from half the movie. Here we go again. Is that Peck? No, it's Diet Peck. Here we go again. Guess the city doesn't believe in ghosts now. Here we go again. Whoa, ghosts running around the city? Here we go again. Look, Janine 2.0 is still hitting on nerds. Here we go again. Remember when Janine and Peter had an antagonistic relationship? Well, now she babysits for him. Here we go again? Ray says I love you, man, and hugs it out with a guy who loves him back as the whole city sings with brotherly love. Here we... No, okay, that never happened in the first one. You get the idea, though. Now, I'm not saying you can't like the second film. I like it, or, well, parts, but I kind of see it as a guilty pleasure. It's not a great movie, and it certainly bears no tonal resemblance to the original. So what went wrong? Well, first, no one wanted to make it. Ivan Reitman, Harold Ramis, and Dan Aykroyd already thought the first film covered everything, but the studio pretty much said, Listen, guys, this'll get made with or without you, so how about you just take our nice big check and cough something up? And then the three of them were like, We're ready to believe you! The second thing is this. There's an interesting theory out there that Ghostbusters is essentially a movie about nothing. And I agree. That's not a criticism, far from it. My favorite movie of all time is The Big Lebowski, and that movie is a movie about nothing. But the problem is you can't have lightning strike twice. A sequel about nothing is incredibly difficult to do. So the creators tried, emphasis on tried, to spice it up by bringing in themes of fatherhood, accepting responsibility, and uh, being excellent to each other, I guess. And that's not the problem. You kind of have to do that at this point. The issue is they wanted it both ways, though. Hey, let's make a movie about something, but also just remake the movie about nothing. And it doesn't work. You gotta come up with something fresher if you're gonna do this. Not saying you can't hit some of the same notes, but this is literally Ghostbusters 1 with all the edge removed. But did it have to be this way? Could it be saved? Well, I don't know about that, but I think a few changes could have gone a long way. And I think it could have been done without having to completely ditch the bones of the film's plot. So let's get started. So we open with Dana Barrett walking down a New York City sidewalk. First things first, no baby. She stops by a newspaper stand and sees a headline about the Ghostbusters. They're going on trial today. She picks it up and stares at it. The newspaper vendor strikes up a conversation. Oh, you following that? Yeah, I think it's sad. These guys saved the city from a 60-foot marshmallow man and then every agency in the state sues them for damages. I mean, how long has this been dragging on? Five years? Jeez, I don't even want to think about it. Dana sighs and buys the paper. Well, it's hard not to think about it when it's your fiancé. Jump cut to Peter Venkman with the rest of the gang, awaiting for court to start. In court, we get treated to pretty much the same deal as the original. Tolly is representing them because they've run out of money, the judge is a skeptic. Maybe we can figure out what the Ghostbusters have been up to via their testimony. You know, Ray runs a bookshop, Egon steals kids' puppies, Winston does birthday parties, and Peter has a lame psychic show. The kicker is Peck is back, and he testifies against them, smugly grinning at Peter the whole time. As Peter himself testifies about the unknown, we dive beneath to the old Van Horn station. A river of blood-red slime flows through the tunnel. And yes, make it the color of blood. Vigo is supposed to be a Vlad the Impaler type, so let's try to make it a little scarier. Anyway, we cut to a crack in the ground and watch the slime rise. 
Back in court, the case draws to a close and the judge reads them the riot act. As he's screaming at them, the bloody slime rises from a crack beneath his feet and the Scaleri brothers emerge. The Ghostbusters are allowed to defeat them, just like in the original, and they emerge triumphant with Peter shouting, We're the best! We're the beautiful! We're the only! Ghostbusters! Boom. We just accomplished in a few minutes what it took a third of the original film to do. Cause yeah, keep in mind, after an exciting movie and multiple seasons of the cartoon show, what kid wanted to see the Ghostbusters as losers who can't bust ghosts for 30 minutes? I mean, you can keep the bureaucratic commentary, but get to the point. So we return to Dana, who's exiting a hospital. She catches the news on the Ghostbusters court victory on a store TV display and bolts. We then cut to the fire station. Janine Melnitz takes a call. Oh, yeah. No, they're indisposed. Yeah, I wouldn't call again. I have a feeling they're going to be gone for a long time. She hangs up, grabs a suitcase, and heads for the door. The Ghostbusters bust in triumphant. Peter asks Janine to put some coffee on, Lee. We pay you for this. Janine seems unimpressed. Great. Dana walks in looking distraught. Peter asks why she wasn't in the courtroom. She says she has something important to tell him, but a couple of cops walk in. Ghostbusters, Mayor wants to speak with you. Peter says, Sorry, honey. Daddy's got a hobnob with the elites. At the mayor's office, a fight rages between the politicians as the Ghostbusters look on. The mayor wants the Ghostbusters to investigate the haunting at the courthouse, but Peck is incredulous. The once skeptical judge is there defending the Ghostbusters. I know what I saw! Peck shoots back. I can't believe you're taking this ghost nonsense seriously. Are you calling a district judge a liar? Peck backs down and smiles. Maybe we can come to a uh, compromise. Then it's settled, the mayor says. Looks like the Ghostbusters are back in business. We then cut to Dana restoring a painting while Janos hits on her. She seems distraught and admits it's about Peter and their future together. Janos tries to convince her that Peter is no good for her. Put off by Yano, she decides to take work off early and go talk to Peter. Back at the station, we see the gang turning the containment unit back on while Lewis unloads their financial situation. All I'm saying is you're going to need to make at least $300,000 in the first quarter alone to cover half your outstanding debt. Peter brushes him off. It's fine, so long as old Rusty here works. Ray flips a switch. All right, she's ready to go, Ray says. Winston holds up a couple of smoking traps. Let's say a arrivederci to the Scaleri brothers. Just then, Peck walks in. Hold it right there. I have a cease and desist forbidding you from using this containment unit. Ray protests. But the mayor said... The mayor agrees with me, Peck shoots back. This facility was involved in a major explosion. And until this storage unit is fully vetted by the EPA, you can hunt ghosts, but you can't store them here. Peter asks... And how long would this vetting take? Peck smiles. Well, we're backlogged, but given the usual channels and the paperwork, four years. This is absurd, Peter says. We'll be out of business. Peck gets uncomfortably close. It's simple capitalism, Dr. Venkman. Adapt or die. Peck leaves and Peter asks what else could go wrong. Suddenly Dana walks in. Peter, I'm pregnant. An awkward beat as the gang gives Peter some space. So Peter and Dana talk elsewhere. Peter asks how this could happen, to which Dana shoots back. I don't know, Peter. Maybe it was the protection you bought at the dollar store. She admits that she doesn't know what to do. She gave up touring the world with the orchestra for him, and since then he's still the same. He never takes anything seriously, the business is in shambles, and she worries that maybe it was just never meant to work out. Peter replies with, You told me that once, and what did I say? I'd solve your little problem, and then you'll say, Peter Vakeman is a guy who can get things done. Peter returns to the gang in the basement. Ray asks, so? Peter says, we need to figure something out. When? Five years ago. We then cut to Janos at night. He gets sat by Vigo. It's pretty much the same deal, except Vigo is looking for someone to bear his child. He needs a queen, and the marriage ceremony needs to happen by New Year's Eve, yada yada yada, they settle on Dana. So now the first act has set up the entire movie and its stakes. Peter needs to get his shit together, the Ghostbusters need to get their shit together, and they need new tech to get rid of the ghosts. And they all need to solve the mystery of what's causing this recent spate of hauntings. And on top of that, Janos and Vigo have designs on Dana. So how do they solve all these problems? 
First, Ray and Egon work on a new device to trap ghosts. Ray explains that they'll use trans-dimensional cross-rift theory, similar to what happened with Gozer. In theory, a number of demons, demigods, slores, and supplicants enter our realm from another ghostly dimension. So instead of storing ghosts in a containment unit, why not boot them to another dimension? After all, the door swings both ways. Blast them, open a portal, throw them in, and lock the door. As Peter notes, Are you telling me the universe runs like New York City? We just ship our trash across the river and make it Jersey's problem? Ray says, more or less. I love it! Venkman replies. So Ray and Egon essentially construct a portable mini cannon which fires remote mines that can cling to walls and ceilings. The mine will then be detonated by a button the Ghostbusters will carry on them. Push it to open, push it again to close. They decide to test it out in the firehouse. They release one of the Scaleri brothers, blast him, fire the cannon, open a portal in the ceiling, lead him up to the hole, and then watch as he gets sucked in. Once Scaleri disappears, Ray says, Ha! I'd think I'd call that a success. Then a giant monster tries to escape from the portal, scaring the hell out of them. They scream and Egon shouts, Close it off! Ray hits the button and the portal closes. Peter says, Okay, important safety tip. Always shut the door behind you. Winston asks, So what do we do now? Ray says, Let's bust some ghosts. And here's the perfect time for a montage. We get the goofy commercial, the driving scenes, the busting scenes, some horrifically dated 90s rap, the whole nine yards. After that, we cut to the courthouse at night where the gang is investigating the Scalari incident. They follow a series of cracks into the basement and find a hole. With the team woefully out of shape, they send Winston down and he finds the old Van Horn station with the River of Blood slime. He accidentally falls in and sees horrific visions of demons torturing ghosts. And on top of a pile of skulls laughing stands Vigo. Vigo's image turns to Winston. Fear, come unto me. The team pulls him out just in time, but just like in the original, he trips on a wire and causes a blackout. Above ground, Winston is suffering from PTSD from the experience. He explains that the slime is like pure fear, terror, and horror all rolled into one. And there was something else there. It's like it was feeding off all the destruction the slime was causing. So yeah, I guess my thing here is that Vigo is kind of like the it spider. He feeds on fear, which makes him stronger, which makes more slime, which makes more hauntings, which makes more fear, which makes him stronger. You get it, it's a feedback loop. The slime stirs up ghosts, and the more scared the city is, the stronger Vigo grows. Across town, Dana is working late on restoring a painting when the lights go out. She finds a flashlight and hears noises. She explores the museum and the unthinkable happens. The paintings come to life and reach out for her. Join us! She screams. Then some armor or terracotta warriors or something come to life. It's a museum, you know, use your imagination. Anyway, she drops the flashlight and runs. The next day, the mayor unleashes his wrath on the gang. Peck is pleased. I told you not to trust these men. The mayor orders him off the investigation and says if there's one more slip up, they'll be shut down for good. At the station, Ray and Egon notice a pattern to all their bus. They follow a straight line. Then Ray overlays an old map of the Van Horn line. They match up. Now the slime was flowing this way, Winston says. Peter asks where the old line ended. They look and Ray says, oh no, it's the art museum. Peter shows up at the museum to meet Dana and says there might be a connection. Has she seen anything? She mentions the incident the night before but thought it was just exhaustion. Then she mentions how she feels that the Vigo painting is always staring at her. We then cut to the whole gang showing up. All right, suck in the guts, guys, with the Ghostbusters. Right away, Winston points to the painting and says to Egon, That's him. That's the guy I saw in the slime. Winston keeps his distance, clearly frightened. The rest of the scene plays out like the original, right down to the Carpathian kitten loss, but with one key difference. After taunting Vigo, it's Peter who gets glared at by the painting and zones out. Back at the firehouse, they analyze the pictures, and Winston says that that's the river of slime he fell into, right behind Vigo's ugly mug. The pictures then set on fire. This time, Peter busts the door down, and Janine flies in with a fire extinguisher. As the smoke clears, they explain the situation to Peter. He then asks what this has to do with Dana. Ray and Egon note that there is a legend that Vigo will return with a bride and a child by his side, like some unholy nativity. But why Dana, Ray? There's millions of women in the city. Ray answers. You forget, Finkman. Only one was touched by the supernatural. Your fiance, up at Spook Central. So because of her encounter with Gozer, she's basically on every spook's radar. To quote Ray, you sure know how to pick them, Peter.
Now, I want to take a second and talk about a couple of characters I haven't mentioned much. What about Janine and Louis? Alright, I'm just gonna say it. I can't stand what they did to Janine in the sequel. Like, who is this? I'm not saying she can't date Lewis, but did they have to turn her into such a cartoon character to do it? Why can't a woman just like a nerd? She liked Egon. But no, we can't accept that. We've got to go full Big Bang Theory on her. <laughs> it's funny, because they're dorks! I mean, if you want to make them romantic, do it organically. Let it develop. Because I do think they work as a duo. They're essentially the B-team. So I thought a fun filler story might be that Janine is convinced the firehouse has a pest problem. There's noises, missing food, scratches on the wall. Eventually she discovers it's Slimer. Thus begins this game of cat and mouse between her and the ghost. Maybe she tries scaring him off. Maybe she tries activating one of the old traps in front of a bucket of fried chicken she left out as bait. Eventually Lewis gets involved and they kind of hit it off while trying to solve this problem. This leads up to a scene where Dana shows up to meet Peter for a dinner date, basically where Peter is going to explain everything about Vigo's plan. Because Dana is early, she spots Janine and Lewis trying to figure out how to turn a proton pack on. All of them are whispering as Slimer gorges himself at the fridge. The three of them figure it out together. Dana says it has to be this button. Janine fires it and misses. She ends up blowing a hole in the wall. Peter walks in and Janine shoves the proton pack in Lewis's hands and tells him to hide it. Peter looks at the flaming wall and asks what the hell happened. Electrical fire. I told you this place was a death trap. Peter explains that if the place needs to be rewired, they'll have to cut the salaries of all non-essential personnel. He then leads Dana out. Dana in turn shrugs at Janine like, Yeah, sorry, I know he's a dick. So Peter and Dana go on their dinner date. Meanwhile, Ray, Egon, and Winston consult Tobin's spirit guide and find out that Vigo had a cursed wedding ring which would tie his spirit to the wearer. It's on display at the city's history museum as part of the Carpathian Collection. Now it all makes sense. This is why Vigo chose New York. They decide to go there, suspecting it'll be pilfered by ghosts. At the museum, the Ghostbusters run into a number of ghosts and Janos, decked out like some ghostly grim reaper or something. They fight a valiant battle in a great action scene, but Janos gets away with the ring. And the museum? Well, it's a mess. Across town, Peter lays out the whole story to Dana. She questions whether this relationship is worth it. I mean, let's face it, Peter. You're not good for me. I'm not good for me. But I fought a Sumerian demigod to hold on to you. Fatherhood's only slightly more terrifying. But if I really am marked, as Egon and Ray say, then I'll be nothing but trouble. Perhaps it'd be easier on all of you if I just left. No. See, that's why we gotta stick together. They'll have your back. I'll have your back. Who else you gonna call? It is literally our slogan! Suddenly the Ghostbusters bust in, smoldering, slimed, and looking like they've been through hell. They explain that Vigo has the ring. Dana has to hide. Cut to a random cop receiving a call. It's Janos on the other line. He lies and says he works at the History Museum, where the Ghostbusters have destroyed numerous priceless artifacts. Meanwhile, Peter puts Dana up in a hotel. She insists she'll be fine and tells Peter to work with the team on a solution. He decides to leave but insists he'll return with his proton pack. On the drive back in Ecto-1, the team brainstorms ideas. All agree that now they're behind the eight ball. Ray notes that Vigo had to have some enemies. Maybe they can call on them from the other side. They can use the slime they collected in the old Van Horn station to find a trace signature. This will give them the right dimension to tap into. But someone would need to go in there. Who? Just then the team pulls up to the firehouse. Cop cars are everywhere. The equipment is being seized. Peck stands by and watches. Peter accuses him of trying to ruin them, but Peck explains that he has nothing to do with it. This is the mayor's doing, Dr. Venkman. He told you one more slip-up and you're through. Well, apparently your friends here destroyed countless priceless artifacts. Then why are you here? Peter asks. Oh, I'm just here for the show. Popcorn? Peck passes a bag of street popcorn he's been munching on. A short beat and jump cut to the Ghostbusters standing outside their firehouse, which is now sealed with police tape. A whole museum, huh? Good job, guys! What's your encore? You gonna blow up the Empire State Building? As Ray, Peter, and Egon argue with each other, Winston steps in. Hey guys, don't you find it a little coincidental how this all happened at once? I mean, now we're defenseless. It's almost like something's trying to split us apart. Ray asks, but why would anyone want to split us apart? It suddenly hits Peter. Dana. So he and the gang bolt towards the hotel. Inside Dana's hotel room, we get a replay of the original bathtub scene. This time I'd have it be the outline of Vigo himself. Rising from the tub, covered in slime, reaching out to her. 
Destroy me, it says. She screams and runs for the door. The door slams. She looks at the window. Down below, the Ghostbusters pull up. They see Dana on the ledge above. Peter shouts that he's coming up, but Ray says, Look! Instead of the baby carriage from the original, it's a haunted black wedding carriage being driven by a crazed Janos. He pulls up next to her and produces a bouquet of black roses. My lady, he says, your carriage awaits. Janos extends his arms and pulls her into the carriage. The door locks and he takes off. Ray says, it's over, Spengler. No, Ray, he replies, I think it's just starting. They look up at the sky. A magical storm gathers, lightning strikes. The night sky goes blood red. Underground, the red slime completely engulfs the old Van Horn station. And this is where I figured we could get the classic Ghostbusters supernatural montage. Only this time, there's a bit of a twist. One of the problems with the original sequel is that we've already seen ghosts running amok in New York City. So why not switch it up a little? I'd have Vigo's demonic army of the undead rise up from the river of slime and possess all the city's statues. Think about it. Imagine all these icons coming to life and running amok, like the Atlas statue in Rockefeller Plaza swinging around his globe at tourists. Maybe the Prometheus statue hurls fireballs at ice skaters. The running bull chases stockbrokers down Wall Street. Considering all of the artwork around New York City, this would be a great love letter to the city itself. And most of it would just be costuming and mat work. So we get a montage of these statues marching around the streets. They stop at the museum and surround it like an army. At City Hall, the city officials are in a panic. The Ghostbusters are there pleading to get their equipment back. As the city leaders lay out the disaster unfolding, Peck sits in the corner, stone cold silent. The mayor turns to him. And I'm sure your position is we shouldn't trust these men? Peck speaks. Actually, Mr. Mayor, I think they should be given whatever resources are necessary. And what the hell brought that on? Did you see Jesus or something? No, Peck replies. I had a long heart-to-heart -heart with my mother last night. And that convinced you? Three things, Peck says. One, my mother said I was being petty to these nice boys. Two, I trust my mother more than anyone else on the planet. Three, my mother's been dead for the last 14 years. Peter seems incredulous. So that's it, huh? After all this time, you just cut the red tape and we're legit? What do you want from us? Peck gets uncomfortably close and stares Peter down. I want you to do what I do every day, Dr. Fenkman. Your job. So Peck here kind of gets a little redemption, which I think is important. One, it takes him beyond one note. And two, it might give William Atherton something to chew on, since he regretted taking the role in the first place, on account of everybody calling him dickless. And honestly, I'd want him back, because their other option, essentially Peck 2.0, just felt like a downgrade. And no, I'm not slamming Kurt Fuller. This guy is an amazing comedic actor. Watch him in Psych if you want to see him at his best. But he's completely wasted here, because the creators pretty much wanted him to be Peck. So the mayor asks the Ghostbusters what they need, and Ray admits that there's not much that the city can do. We need outside help, he says. So surrounded by National Guard troops, the Ghostbusters suit Winston up. They've analyzed the signature of the slime, which will give them the gateway to the right dimension. They plug their coordinates into the remote cannon. The gang asks Winston if he's sure about this. He says that having fallen into the slime, he's tasted fear. Knowing what it's like to come in contact with something from the other side, he's the only one best equipped to do this. Vigo's tortured and killed thousands during his lifetime, Ray says. He fed off their fear to grow his own power. He's probably still feeding on it. There's got to be some spirits over there with an axe to grind. Find them and bring them back. We'll meet you at the museum. See you on the other side, Winston. See you on the other side, Ray. So Winston hops through the portal. And yes, this gives something for Winston to do. And inside the ghost dimension, things can get really wild. Imagine seeing the sort of place where a being like Gozer would come from. Maybe it's very sci-fi, maybe it's like some Hieronymus Bosch style hellscape. Whatever it is, the matte painters and special effects animators could have a field day. So Winston finds the victims of Vigo, impaled peasants, soldiers killed in Vigo's wars, and they try to scare him off. After all, he doesn't belong there. But Winston pushes back and gives a badass speech. You know, something to the effect of, I fought 60-foot marshmallow men and moldy old Babylonian gods. To which the ghost replies, You mean Gozer? Yeah. It's Sumeria. Whatever. Point being, I'm not afraid of you. You're scared. And I get that. I felt that fear, but you've got to face it and fight it. 
Think Aragorn summoning the army of the dead in Return of the King, that sort of thing. The spirits tell him that Vigo's minions are too many and that the city is too scared. They would need to take charge of something so huge, so good that it would inspire the masses and break his evil hold on the city. Winston has an idea. Meanwhile, the Ghostbusters approach the museum and see the line of statues. They charge their blasters. The crowd roars. Back at the portal, Winston emerges with a bunch of ghosts. The National Guard is ready to shoot, but Winston explains that they're the good guys. The guards ask Winston what he needs. He says, A boat. Somewhere in here we cut to Dana. Pretty much like the other film, she's locked behind doors as Janos hits on her. He explains the plan, Vigo will possess him and they will be wed. Dana seems unenthused. Janos hears cheering outside and leaves to investigate. Outside, the Ghostbusters begin fighting and get their asses handed to them. There's just too many statues and the proton packs can't seem to penetrate the marble and the steel. They seem magically invincible. We then cut to Winston, who's at the base of... something. We don't know what yet. But he's looking up. He turns to the ghosts. You think there's enough of you to possess something this big? The lead ghost nods. Then I sure hope this works. All right, boys, start her up! The ghosts swirl around Winston and fly up off camera, creating mighty flashes of light. Back at the museum, the Ghostbusters are crouching behind some debris, trying to regroup. It's no use, Ray says. The city is scared. City scared? I'm scared! You don't get it, Finkman. Fear is what gives Vigo his power. Unless there's something that can snap the city out of it, we're doomed. Janos stands atop the roof, taunting them. You are like the buzzing of flies to Vigo! Venkman swears he'll take the little worm down, to which Yano shouts, Yeah, Dr. Venkman, you and what army? Just then, there's a whistle. Everyone turns. It's Winston. Yo, guys! There's a large series of booms, and here we get the big reveal. It's the Statue of Liberty come to life, possessed by thousands of ghosts. Winston points to the statues, and Janos, Sick of Here we get something a little more punchy than the original, where the statue was, um... Just walking around, I guess? In this version, she steps on all the statues guarding the museum, maybe picks some up and tosses them, and as the crowd cheers at the sight, the barriers around the museum start to crumble. Finally, Lady Liberty picks up the Atlas statue's globe and bowls it right through the front door. Inside, Janos has already grabbed Dana and brought her to the makeshift altar in front of the painting, shouting, Vigo, you must hurry, they are coming! Just then, the door busts open and Janos and Dana dive out of the way of the rolling globe. Peter shouts, Happy New Year! Peter and Dana embrace, and they all stare at the painting. Ray says, Let's blast him! But Janos jumps in front of them like a human shield and tries to grab their blasters. Ray, Egon, Winston, and Dana tussle with Janos while Peter slowly walks away. He's fixated on the painting. It glares at him. Dana slaps Janos across the face. He falls. Winston points the blaster at his head. Play it cool now. The gang then stares at Peter. His proton pack falls to the ground. Then we see the painting. Hey, it's gone, Ray says. So, yeah, the painting is there, but Vigo is missing. Dana asks, Peter, what happened? Peter! Suddenly, Peter turns around, eyes glowing, teeth sharpened, bearing an uncanny resemblance to Vigo. Much like the original, he explains in the demonic voice that Peter is no more. There is only Vigo! Now, this is actually a nod to something that the cartoon did that I thought was brilliant. See, there was an episode where Peter gets possessed by a ghost and shuts down the containment unit, and it got me thinking, why did that feel so much better with Peter than with Ray? And I realized, well, Ray, he's kind of an idiot. Possessing him doesn't seem like a challenge, but Peter? He's the anchor, the mouth, the skeptic, the one who just doesn't get phased by anything. As a kid, he always felt kind of safe, untouchable even. So to have him get possessed would carry more weight. Anyway, possessed Peter knocks the Ghostbusters back with his black magic, paralyzing them. He then reaches for Dana, who is pulled to him by some unseen force. He then force pulls Janos up to the altar and orders him to officiate. Janos starts having second thoughts, but Vigo zaps him back into place. Okay, okay, fine. Dana, do you? Peter interrupts. She does. Janos continues. And obviously, uh, you do. So, uh, just place sitting, I guess, and it's all over. The demonic Peter pulls her hand out and tries to place the ring on it. Dana resists. Peter! She pleads, fighting him. You said you'd always have my back. You said you wanted to be a father. 
and now you're gonna hand me and your child over to this monster? That's not the Peter I know. The Ghostbusters join in, urging Peter to fight. Demonic Peter nearly puts the ring on her finger, but pulls back and shouts, Arr! Peter is at war with himself now. He phases in and out of Vigo and Venkman. We cut to Dana, who's putting Peter's proton pack on. She arms the blaster. Peter! She shouts. The demonic Venkman turns to face her. She fires the blaster, splitting Vigo's ghost from Venkman's body. The other Ghostbusters are freed and get up. They open fire. Peter then stumbles up and approaches Dana. You mind? Peter asks. Dana takes the pack off and hands it to Peter. He shouts at Vigo. All right, you blonde bimbo! Nobody Linda Blair's me! Say hi to your kitten for me! He opens fire. Egon and Ray fire their portal guns at the painting and hit the detonate buttons. A massive portal opens up, sucking everything into it. We see Vigo's minions fly by. We see flying debris. A candlestick knocks Janos right on the head and he passes out. The Ghostbusters and Dana hold on to some pillars, but shockingly, Vigo stands firm. I'm Vigo, the scourge of Bavaria, the soul of Bavaria, the... He pauses. Suddenly, Vigo's countless victims float into the room. Winston shouts, Oh yeah, keep going. The scourge, the sorrow. Yeah, yeah, they know who you are. And boy, do they have a bone to pick with you. Vigo looks at them, horrified. Have a good one, Winston adds. The ghosts fly through Vigo into the portal. Each one forces him to stumble. Slowly, he's pulled back, flailing and tripping until finally he's lost in the swirling whirlpool. Shut it off, Ray shouts, and boom, show over. I figure you get a little bit with Dana and Peter, Janos has amnesia, and maybe the painting is a wedding scene now with Peter, Dana, and the others or something. I don't know. Outside, Peck confronts Venkman. Well, I'm afraid this is goodbye, Dr. Venkman. Dana is incensed. You're not shutting them down again, are you? No, Peck says. I'm taking a desk job. Someplace quieter. Someplace away from all this supernatural mumbo jumbo. South Dakota. As Peck leaves, Ray asks Peter, You think I should tell him how many haunted Indian burial grounds there are out there? Don't ruin the surprise, Ray. The gang runs into the mayor. Lenny! Looks like you'll live to see your third term. Don't worry, we'll send you the bill. Now just a second, you ain't done here. Ray butts in. Mr. Mayor, we saved the city. We saved the world. What else is there? What about that? The mayor points to the Statue of Liberty standing in the middle of the road. Peter smirks. Ah, um, call his secretary. She lives to handle stuff like this. They walk off. Winston passes the mayor and notes to him. Uh, just so you know, that was all them. I was in another dimension. He winks, flashes a smile, and the uncredits play the Ghostbusters theme. Now, one fun idea might be a mid credit sequence, maybe after the closing montage or something. It's a few months later, we're in a hospital room. Outside the window, we can see the Statue of Liberty is back in its right place, but like covered in scaffolding or something. Dana's just given birth, and she and Peter are discussing names. She jokingly suggests Vigo Jr. and Janos. On the other side of the room, Ray, Egon, and Winston are talking amongst themselves. Ray notes that, With Peter having a kid, we might end up getting short-staffed. We may need to hire a fifth member. What about you, Dana? You seem pretty good with a proton pack. Dana glares at him. No. Ray shrugs. Well, there's gotta be somebody. Cut to the firehouse. The team is adjusting a proton pack, but we can't see who's wearing it yet. Are you sure you're okay with this? Ray asks. Egon adds, Just to let you know, there's a 10% risk that using a proton pack can increase the likelihood of brain tumors. We hear a familiar voice. It's Janine Melnitz. Oh, don't worry about me, boys. She pulls the blaster out of its holster. I've been waiting for this moment for a long time. She arms the blaster, special effects blazing. Oh, Dr. Venkman! Let's discuss my salary. Janine runs off with Lewis following behind. Wait! You should let me sit in on the negotiations! I'll make sure you don't get bumped up into a higher tax bracket! And roll the rest of the credits. And there it is! Ghostbusters New 2. It's in the same wheelhouse as the original sequel, but we're not starting over from scratch. It's got some scares and some ghostbusting for the kids, and there's a few thematic elements to chew on for adults. I'd say the overall themes are adapt or die and facing your fears. Peter faces responsibility, marriage, and impending fatherhood. Dana faces her fear that Peter might not be up to the challenge. And Ray and Egon, well, they were already kind of developed as it was, but 
I'd play up their need to help solve the mystery, create new tech, and help Peter and Dana out. For them, their fear is simply failure to adapt. For Winston, it's a literal fear. He actually faces ghosts and monsters straight on and uses his courage to rally tortured spirits under the yoke of Vigo. This is one of those crossover themes that kids ever afraid of monsters under the bed can totally identify with. And Janine and Lewis begin to learn the tech in order to take on Slimer. Kids can get on board with that. I mean, who the hell doesn't want to play with these toys? On top of that, we also get to visit the ghost dimensions and see new tech that's more impressive than a mood slime cannon. Now, would all this make a great movie? One as good as the original? If I'm being honest with myself, eh, probably not. Would it be better than what we got? I mean, I'll toot my own horn here because that's the entire conceit of the show and say, yes? But it's not like I'm in love with it. And that's the thing. I don't think anybody's ever going to figure this out. Ghostbusters was a one-shot deal, a zeitgeist, a lightning strike that lived and died in 1984. We're never gonna get the original back. Hell, we couldn't even get them back in 1989. Like the gritty New York it was filmed in, this type of grimy, adult 80s comedy that somehow also appealed to kids is long gone. Now every Ghostbusters product has to run through the Hollywood homogenizer to make the blandest, family-friendliest product possible. Ghostbusters 2016 isn't some root cause of the franchise's disease, it's the symptom. The final, sad, end result of decades of bad franchise choices, brought on by the unintended consequences of attracting a younger audience. And where did that start? I don't know, maybe look at the film that plays like Baby's Day Out crossed with Goosebumps? You know, the one that opened with our heroes doing kids' birthday parties? Or maybe it was earlier. Perhaps, and this is the scariest thing of all, maybe it was the real Ghostbusters. As amazing as that show is, and I still think it holds up, the second the franchise became a kid's property, it was all over. And that's a weird feeling, knowing that I, myself, by watching the cartoon and buying the toys, probably helped defang this series for good. So maybe we have to face facts here. There was never going to be a sequel that worked. Hell, I wrote this treatment, and guess what? I wouldn't want to direct it, and I certainly wouldn't want to touch the 2016 reboot either. And the new one coming out? Well, maybe I'm wrong, and I would love to be. Please, dear God, let me be wrong. But I'm not holding out much hope. You just can't recapture this one, Hollywood. You can only make it less sucky. Perhaps this is why the best spin-offs are the most far removed from film itself. A video game and a cartoon. Perhaps that's where the franchise belongs now. But what do I know? Maybe you agree with me, maybe you don't. Let us know, and feel free to share your ideas about what would make a great Ghostbusters sequel.